Yo, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to this week's Touch Base. I'm so glad to see you again, and I'm looking forward to our engagement today. I I was been watching a lot of football of late as a standard. I'm concerned about the Premier Soccer League. How is it that Chiefs are only playing once a month? Like, like I've worked it out. Like, I feel like they play, then they have like an international break, and then a tournament break, and then they play again, and then there's a break. Dante is Chief. I, I, I want really for Minister McKenzie. Please just make sure you investigate the Premier Soccer League. I want to understand why Kaiser Chiefs are playing only monthly. Um, that seems like quite concerning. But we are for those of you who are supporters of any other team other than Liverpool. Like Christmas, if you are looking for us, you are going to find us on top of the table. Uh, at the top, at the top of the table. That's 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 where we are. That's that's how we roll nowadays. Um, and also, congratulations to the Springboks. Um, what an incredible year the Springboks have had. But isn't it unbelievable? They've used 50 players this year. 50 new, 50 players. Which means that they've had unlimited budget as a start. But it means the depth of the Springboks squad is looking healthier and better. And so I'm looking forward to the next number of years of Springbok Rugby. I think it'll be fantastic. But more to the business of this week, I, I, I want to look at something that's been concerning for me. And I, and I make this, I'll expand a little bit more on it in the next couple of weeks. But when, have you ever had a moment where if you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at your body, looks at your health, looks at your breathing, as I do, it's towards the end of the year. And so every so often, I have to go for physicals or even my medical aid insists that I go for regular checkups. Now, when you arrive there and the medical aid says to you, listen, you're carrying a little bit more weight or you are, your sugar levels are higher or your breathing is worrying or whatever, these things could either mean you could have potential type 2 diabetes in the long run or these things could mean the following things. You kind of listen to those warnings and you do something about it. As it happens, I went to the doctor last, I went for my physical last year and they said to me, you're a little bit overweight and all that kind of jazz. And so I decided I'm going to do a couple of things to change my life this year. So this, I've finished the year, literally have changed my diet, have been training, I'm feeling, I'm looking good. But yeah, you can vote. If you don't think so, that's okay. But I've been working on it. I'm going for an assessment soon. I'll challenge everybody. I'll try and post my results and all of that. I took up running. I did a number of things. But I, it struck me that I have got really at this point in time no serious chronic illness, but I made adjustments. I can't make adjustments when you have already type 2 diabetes or chronic, virus, chronic illness like cancer, whatever the case might be. And I was thinking about this, about government. Government gets warnings. It was warned in 2008, or it was warned much earlier than that, that you are going to run out of power and government did nothing. And then we had a, over, low, over a decade, over nearly two decades of load shedding. It was warned a number of years ago that municipalities are going to battle to pay water boards unless we begin to review what the white paper on municipalities is, and also unless we review what the municipal equitable share is. Government has ignored that. I'm telling you now, the flickering lights are starting and we're going to have water shedding. Government was warned that money has been stolen. And so unless you do something about capacitating units that fight corruption, make sure the state is functional, government ignored them. And now today, we're in a fiscal constraint where literally government is running out of money. I, I put this to you to say, sometimes we panic now. We're panicking now that we've got whatever the crisis is. But many of the crises South Africa is facing up to have been long in the making. Let me tell you another one. Education. We're going to have a very unskilled labor a decade from now. We're going to wonder why young people cannot work from anywhere else. Yet the warnings are coming through now. Dropout rates are high. Curriculum is, is, not, is not great in certain instances. Uh, you know, all of those things. 
But no, 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 we ignore them. Municipalities are not able to pay ESCOM. The ESCOM debt is ballooning. Three years from now, we'll be talking about another bailout for ESCOM. No money to do anything else because we've got to pay ESCOM. But no one wants to do anything now. I'm here to challenge all of us to say, let us take action immediately when things happen. Because if we don't, later when there are crises, it's almost too late. Municipalities don't even pay pension funds for their workers. Already by then, by the time the worker retires, it is a massive crisis. Fellow South Africans, now is the time to act. Words have long passed. We don't have the fiscal room to play around anymore. Now is the time for action. So, along with that, I want to highlight just another crisis that's been long booming, which is the issue of gender based violence. I begin by emphasizing the fact that I, like I, am a husband to one wife, I am a father to two girls, I am a brother to two sisters. I, there are enough women around in my life, and there's a community of South Africans that. In essence, this is a crisis that is occurring that is a cancer that is eating away at our society. And I, I won't deny, as a man, as I waved goodbye to a very good female friend of mine yesterday as she got onto an Uber, the thought struck me, what would happen if something went on in that Uber? Because not only was it driven by a male and she was a female, I thought to myself, I've ne- that thought has never crossed me as a man. But I can appreciate that for many women, this is a crisis. Sexual violence is at pandemic levels in this country. We cannot afford to keep talking about it. It's one of these things now that actually only action will deliver words for us. And as I sit in Parliament, I've been thinking extensively about some of the crucial, crucial interventions that we've got to do. And and as many of you know, BOSA has been calling extensively to make uh, the sexual offenders register a public document because like anyone else, I've been as a male to a police station to try and get to see if I'm on the sexual offenses register, just, just to see what the process looks like. And it is cumbersome, it is difficult, and ultimately at the end of the day puts employers, uh, people who work to employing predators or ultimately to have predators walking around freely freely around this country. The other day, we also decided to go to a police station to go see what the process of reporting rape is like. And when you arrive there, police don't always even have rape kits in there, which makes it harder for prosecution to take place. Often when you arrive there, the examiners, the uh, the people who are meant to examine the, 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 the victim are not always on site, which means secondary trauma occurs as the woman has to travel from one place to another to try and get an examination done. We, at some level, yes, we can't deal with the scourge at prosecution as a start. First, we have to heal our society. We have to fix it. I want to say to every man out there, think about it this way. What if that was your daughter? What if that was your mother? I think we need to think twice about standing by when you hear someone make a comment about a woman. We need to think twice about standing by when you hear screaming next door or in your own home. Man, I I was reading even in the Bible today, I just thought to myself, when there's been violence against women, the community needs to act. And it cannot act in soft ways. It needs to act in the most aggressive manner to scourge it out. Because when it spreads, it spreads like wildfire. In this instance, we've got to build a society not only that holds itself accountable, that violence against women can no longer be tolerated, but that ultimately the second part is obviously the policing bit, which is about making sure that rape kits are available. It's about making sure that it's easier for women to report a crime. I've often wondered why we don't use technology more so that the the victim doesn't have to go into the police station, that special courts are established so that we can prosecute 
quickly and effectively and make sure that um, that uh, per uh, perpetrators of gender-based violence are locked away and that ultimately we do the hard, hard yards of making sure that I, even as a father, raise men who are able to stand up and defend, who are able to be responsible uh, and ultimately not be those who perpetuate violence against women. I, I just think that when I look at my son, the job every day he knows in our house, you can do many things, but if you lift up your hand against your sister or anyone else, that is a serious, serious offense. And I, as a father, um, can do nothing more than protect him and make sure I raise a young man who is responsible, responsible around women. And so this is a fight. A long second uh, issue I want to touch base on is that let's all welcome the marginal improvements on uh, uh, crime stats that took place recently. I think it's good to note the fact that 5.8% uh, drop in the murder rate is a positive step. Um, and I think as a society, we need to recognize that for a country outside war, we are living in a very violent society. South Africans are uh, are being murdered, and this is simply a condition we cannot live with. And therefore, I think it's welcome that there are some collective leadership between the minister and the police, that there's a sense upon which, uh, you know, criminals are starting to feel the pain, but we've got to do more. And part of what I think we need to be doing more is about ensuring that we get down to regionalization of police so that we've got better intelligence closer to the ground, that we lock away criminals that commit violence and make sure that murder is an is a priority. We can, you know, priority, priority. As I've said to you before in this touch base, I said, I'm sick and tired of police stopping me to examine whether or not my license disc is up to date. I get the broken windows thing. Don't tell me all about it. I get it. But here's the thing. Murder is serious. It's serious in our townships. It's serious uh, in communities. It is serious a murder that takes place in a farm, anywhere else, it's still murder. And therefore, we need to be intentional about fighting against murder. And that's why I think urgently, let's ensure that we bring intelligence closer to the ground. Those who commit murder must pay the penalty. And we've got to be much more effective at the collection of evidence so that the conviction rate improves. Because at this point in time, the conviction rates are so low that someone who commits murder can be back on our streets, which many communities tell me so. And I, I really think that it's important that we begin to fight this. And along with that, the community in Elsa Trafir, I'm, I'm burdened by that. I'm pained by it, that actually even children are victims in this instance. And, and, and Gang wars, violent crime is affecting all of us in society. So whilst I want to say to the Minister of Police, keep the journey, keep fighting, more can be done in this regard. And so just in closing, as I look at this issue, of course, today being Tuesday, Tuesday uh, has been the fight against uh, this Palapala issue. And Palapala is an interesting uh, stage. Uh, in our democracy, because it goes to the heart of what presidential accountability looks like. Look, I know many people would say at one level, the criminal process has taken place. And yes, um, the public protector, who's the only one capacitated to investigate the issue, has to investigate the president and come to a finding, and which she has. The South African Revenue Service needs to be able to educate all of us about what happens when large transits of money taking place in our country. That's got to be that has already happened, and a report has been tabled on that regard. But this third part, I think, is the important issue. It's about how the president relates to parliament. Already, we don't have an oversight committee on the president, which is something that will continue. It's for matters such as this one that there needed to be an oversight committee on the president. The president would have been well within his or her rights to come and appear before the committee. As it speaks to the issue of Palapala, Pala, a report that was tabled by the same parliament, cannot be voted to be ignored by the same parliament. It must be processed by a committee. And therefore, I stand with those who say an ad hoc committee must have been established. No wrongdoing on the part of the president. All he needs is to come and explain to the people of this country what his version took place and for parliament to be able to exercise its oversight role in this regard. This is an important matter, not only of transparency, but it speaks to the fact that the president is accountable to the people, not only to the law agencies, etc., is accountable to the people, and the people are represented in parliament, and the president can come and account before 
the people of South Africa. So, fellow South Africans, this is going to be an important test. I'm interested to see what the Concord will rule on this issue, and I'm interested to see what Parliament will do on this matter. On that note, I look forward to seeing you again next week. Remember, when you are looking for Liverpool, you'll find us on top of the table. Much love. Bye.